So good afternoon, everyone. I think we're all up and running here. Um, my name is Joanne Conklin. I'm the director of the David Winton Bell Gallery. And I want to thank everyone for joining us out there in cyberspace in this world, weird world we live in now. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Brown University and the List Art Building in which the Bell Gallery is situated sits on occupied indigenous lands, which are the traditional lands of the Narragansett and Wampanoag people. We note also that our campus drew its early life's blood from the African slave trade and that there are buildings on campus that were constructed by enslaved people. These acknowledgements commit us as a community to a lifetime of anti-racist work. So tonight, I am um, really delighted to have the artist Lisa Rihanna with us. And she's going to be talking to us about her stunning digital work entitled In Pursuit of Venus. And I had sort of, um, well, I'm just going to go on, sorry. So um, I first saw this work in 2017, and I've been totally enthralled with it and wanted to bring Lisa and the work to Brown since then. Um, in Pursuit of Venus is a phenomenal work of technical innovation. It was a decade in the making, and it's a response, or if you will, a corrective to 18th century enlightenment representations of the Pacific, and <clears throat> specifically to the representations in a French scenic wallpaper called Natives of the South Pacific, which was uh, created about 1804. Lisa has been a significant figure in the development of contemporary art and contemporary Maori art in New Zealand since the 1990s. She was choos chosen to represent New Zealand in the 2017 Venice Biennale, and her presentation there of In Pursuit of Venus garnered widespread critical acclaim and brought Lisa increased international recognition. Um, since then, the work has traveled across the globe, sort of winding its way eastward from New Zealand to Hawaii, to San Francisco, and to Toronto, where it's been shown over the past year. And it was scheduled to be at the Bell Gallery now. If it wasn't for COVID, oh, we would be watching it in person. But um, we are working on rescheduling for fall of 2021, just about a year from now. And therefore, this conversation serves as a, a preview of some of the many topics that are intertwined in the works and which we'll be able to delve in more deeply to next year. Um, <clears throat> I just want to mention that today's program is part of Remaking Re the Real, the kickoff festival for the three-year theme being explored by the Brown Arts Initiative. And I want to thank the BAI staff for their truly Herculean efforts in keeping programming online throughout this difficult time. And, and particularly to Sean Tavares, who is uh, working with us on tech today, and to Greg Picard. So the program will proceed with a presentation by Lisa, followed by conversation with our other guests. And I, so I'd like to um, introduce them very briefly. Um, the first, Lisa uh, Julia Lum, is an assistant professor of art history at Scripps College. She specializes in art and culture of the 18th century to the present in Britain and the former, former British Empire. And she has a particular interest in points of intersection and collision between indigenous and colonial cultural practices. Our second respondent is Marissa Angel Brown. Marissa is a cultural historian and a curator. She is the assistant director for programs at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities. And her research spans American visual culture, urban history, architecture and preservation. And she focuses specifically on issues related to power, race and identity. Now, while planning for showing in Pursuit of Venus uh, at Brown, I learned that there is a similar 18th century French wallpaper hanging in the foyer of the John Nicholas Brown Center. This one is called Views of North America. 
different settings, but a lot of the same um, kind of problems that come up in terms of um, representations to indigenous people. Uh, this wallpaper has been the focus of discussions over the past couple of years and JNBC and, and specifically Marissa is organizing a conference around the issues raised by the wallpaper that will coincide with the Bell's display of Pursuit of Venus next year. So everybody come back in a year. We're going to do it again. Um, and our, our third respondent is Anawan Whedon. Anawan is a performer and educator. He is an enrolled member of his mother's Mashpee Wampanoag tribal community, which is out on Cape Cod. Anawan teaches Eastern Woodlong Song and Dance, both independently and previously he taught at the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nations Cultural Resource Department, which is in um, our neighboring state of Connecticut. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Lisa. Well, no, first I want to say thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And uh, now I will turn this over to Lisa, who can start her presentation. Ah, kia ora koutou katoa, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, uh, ko puhonga tohora te maunga, ko hokeanga nui a kupe te moana, ko ngā puhi te iwi, ko ngā tuki matawharoa te, te waka. Uh, ko Lisa Rehana taku ingoa. Uh, ngā, me, ngā mihi ki te Narragansett me Wampana people, uh, ngā tuturu people of the lands. And um, yes, greetings from New Zealand. Um, I'd just like to thank Joanne uh, and her team for organising this um, pro this um, event. And um, and what I'm going to do is start by um, sharing a little bit of the work um, initially so that people <clears throat> can get a sense of what it is that I'm talking about. But um, my first image here is um, to show the inspiration for In Pursuit of Venus Infected uh, came from this French scenic wallpaper called Les Sauvages de la Mer Pacifique the savages of the Pacific. And I really love this image, um, a very early um, iPhone that I had at that time. It's kind of a conversation between um, history, technology, a woman to a person that I've never met before, who was the entrepreneur of the wallpaper. And that was uh, Dufour, a, a French um, entrepreneur. So, um, what I have here is a five minute sequence. It's um, very hard to tell. And here we go. Oh, 
expression is it? What do you think that they need to do this out? little video clip um, hopefully gives you a sense of the scale of the work um, as does this image here uh, just included to give you a sense that there's um, an immersive experience as you're watching in pursuit of Venus unfold um, it was important for me to show uh, the welcome ceremony which is performed by the Kumari mob um, who are from um, Australia, around Botany Bay, where Captain Cook first landed. Um, and in the original wallpaper, Aboriginal people are, are very insignificant, and I took this opportunity to bring them up front and um, much closer to the viewer um, in, in my version of it. So I just wanted to quickly show a couple of images um, in terms of uh, my research for the work. I was very lucky to um, undertake a residency in Montalvo, um, the Lucas residency, and during that time I just sort of surrounded myself with a lot of the imagery um, to really try and get inside what this, the many, many stories and histories that this wallpaper um, allowed me to research. Um, Things such as, this is a very important illustration which is held in um, the British, in Britain, I think it's the British Library. And it's a drawing by Tupaya, who is the Tahitian navigator that attended and accompanied Captain Cook and Joseph Banks on the first voyage. So this illustration is important because it's um, 
it's a Tahitian person um, reconciling or a reckoning with um, Western illustration techniques, but certainly his powers of observation and detail are incredibly important and drove a number of the um, vignettes or scenes that I included in the work. Um, as did this little image here, it was a book that my girlfriend um, produced during the time that I was making this work. And I had not, this was an, a little illustration that was unearthed called The Bride of Mangaya. And I love this sort of image of um, the bride walking across the backs of the villagers as, as he has been conveyed to the marriage ceremony. So we reenacted this particular um, scene in the work as well. Um, I think working on In Pursuit of Venus, what's really important is there are so many people and, and, um, and nationalities, uh, not just the Pacific people, Maori, but um, Westerners um, inside the work. So there was a, a great, um, once I'd written this things, uh, there was this thing of how was I going to afford to do it and how could I take it on and who would I work with? So this is one of our first um, gatherings together with, all, with some of the um, actors who are in the project. Um, I tried to be really organised in terms of, I knew that I wanted to show the work in Hawaii and of course with Captain Cook's death in Hawaii, um, that was a major, um, a, a major focus for me. So um, here's me on the left hand side working on a, um, uh, the costume of the Tahitian chief mourner, um, inspired by Tupaya's illustration. And on the left hand side, um, this is in the getting the Hawaiian performers ready for their scene. Um, we have a festival here called the Pacifica Festival. So sometimes I would spend a bit of time organizing to do a shoot um, just around when a lot of different Pacific groups happen to be traveling in Auckland. Um, the work was kind of shot maybe uh, four, four or five different um, moments over three different years. So I could only ever afford to do small amounts at a time, um, but tried to be incredibly efficient with the way that I worked. Um, I, while Pacifica Festival was on, Trisha Allen, who's a um, um, expert in tattoo culture, Pacific tattoo culture, was in town. So um, we took the opportunity to um, to get her to make a design. Um, and this particular one is on my friend Ali. It took all day to complete it, even on felt tips. Um, but it was a way of being able to bring back um, and look at this incredible um, technique and culture. Originally, I, had, I was interested in quite a different design, but um, due to Trisha's, um, her, she, she she said, no, the blackout designs were a way of erasing um, this, these cultural practices. So we went back to a much earlier um, design, which we have here. And this gives you a sense of how um, all I could do this, produce this work over a number of years because it's shot green screen. Um, the background of In Pursuit of Venus is an illustration, a digital illustration. And um, quite early on, we came up with the technique of deciding that every scene would be shot at two o'clock in the afternoon. So we could sort of lock off a few aspects, um, the position of the camera, um, the position of the lighting. So whenever we did do any recording, any new scenes, they would all sit quite similarly uh, together. As I indicated before, just being able to go to um, Australia was really difficult for me, uh, just culturally, working out how to, to best go about being able to um, record um, some Aboriginal content. Pacific um, was easier here in New Zealand because Auckland is one of the biggest Pacific cities uh, in the world. Uh, whereas Aboriginal culture is quite different. Um, so after uh, being chosen to represent um, New Zealand at the Venice Biennale, I worked with the Campbelltown Art Centre and their elders and uh, got permission to record a number of scenes. Um, and 
And one of the scenes I'm very proud of is very quiet um, and it's a group of women uh, weaving and women creating possum skin um, cloaks. So I said to the ladies, if you're not there, you're kind of absent. And so I really talked, talk, talked with them and worked with them um, to, to make them feel strong enough to be part of the project. So I, I think, um, you know, there's the combination of friends, lots of non-actors in the project, um, but that becomes part of the, the, um, the joy of the work too. There's, there's a sort of, um, it's the people who wanted to be involved ended up in it. And then it was an opportunity to, I mean, Waka culture is really important to us and I wanted to um, create, I created these 3D uh, Waka uh, just to have an equalization. Of course, we had Captain Cook's endeavor, there's sort of Western boats. So I needed to look at different ways of sort of including other cultures. And for us, while, um, while Captain Cook seemed to is uh, a hero as seen to have discovered the Pacific. Uh, we always knew about it and it is a super highway and a place of great, um, exchange over multiple generations. So um, this was a way of looking at our, our histories and the kind of engineering practices and just the incredible knowledge, skills that um, our ancestors had. This work was also a wonderful opportunity to, um, to open the doors and actually get, get them behind the scenes of lots of um, museums and universities and collections. This is um, um, Tahitian Chief Mourner Mask, which is at the Cambridge Museum. And um, it's a real privilege to really be able to be so close to these wonderful beautiful and, and powerful works. Um, and by doing that, I, it was a way of um, extending the, the awareness of In Pursuit of Venus, the fact that I was making it, um, was bringing it onto other people's radars. But also by, by being able to look at these collections, I'm also able to um, bring as much integrity or um, knowledge as I possibly can to the work, which was always um, an issue for me, um, trying to represent so many different cultures um, and, and really come to some kind of conclusion about how, how I could do that um, as well. I worked uh, with the Royal Society in London. Um, this is the telescope that uh, Captain Cook uh, viewed the transit of Venus and uh, the center image is the clock of which we photographed um, and it's actually there's a still image of it in in the work and this is the clock that set um, Greenwich Mean Time was used while he was recording the transit of Venus and um, was quite an, quite different to the clocks that we understand today. Because of that, we my partner James, who recorded the sound as the sound producer, we also recorded the sound of the clock and had that um, ticking and it appears just before his, his death. So the sound of time um, became really important in this project. One of the wonderful things that's been um, come as a result of uh, completing the work and now taking it to a presentation is the opportunities that it has outside of itself as a as a um, artwork or as an artifact. The images on the left hand side show um, we created a pan tribal porphyry or welcome ceremony at Honolulu, Honolulu Museum of Art, and um, and that was really important. This is a private museum, but we had hundreds and hundreds of people come and it was the first time that they'd ever experienced um, something such, such as a welcome ceremony. So I think there are other opportunities that this opens up um, and that's been incredible, incredibly powerful. Um, Honolulu Art Museum also has a um, set, a complete set of the wallpaper. So I got to view that um, earlier on as we were planning for the exhibition. This is an earlier version, which I showed at uh, Museum Van Loon in Amsterdam. 
Um, but what I knew was that uh, there's a waka that is based on our waka, or Nga Tupi Matafaurua, up north in our marae, our tribal marae. And there's a um, relationship between the university uh, rowing team and each year they bring out a group of students who come to the Waitangi, learn about Maori culture so that they can be good um, keepers of this waka, which actually stays, it resides in um, Leiden, in um, Holland. And it was a really interesting experience because I told them about it. So we decided that we would open the ceremony by um, arriving at the doorsteps of the museum and me hopping off um, from the boat, <laughs> from the walker. Um, so there was this incredible moment where I had Dutch, uh, a Dutch group of students teaching me how to, um, to be a kaihoi or a rower and to do um, some of the haka that they have learnt in relation to this. Part of the way I, um, I sort of funded the work was to also um, create imagery as I was going through things that sat outside of the wallpaper, almost creating my own wallpapers with some of the um, characters who you see in, in the work. Um, and this is an image of uh, the presentation at uh, Venus Biennale. And one of the things I love about the work, there's a lot of people in it and a lot of people sit and watch it. So there's this kind of conversation back through time and this it generates a sort of interest in, in our histories and our, and our knowledge um, systems here. Um, this is just a, few, uh, a range of images from a show I did at uh, Perth. Uh, two years ago. Um, within that work, I had a series of, I, I reconstructed some telescopes with images inside them. So uh, kind of reverse engineering what telescopes are designed to do. But really, um, it was for me to think about um, in pursuit of Venus as an idea is, um, and in cinema terms, POV is point of view. So that idea of looking far, but seeing things close to yourself is a really interesting idea. Um, we call them telescopes today, but originally they were called perspectival tubes. So I like this idea that I was changing the perspective um, around these um, particular works. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, although it's a work that uh, looks back to a historic point of view uh, and kind of re-examines that and challenges it, it's also a highly um, contemporary and digital work. So um, in the making of it, I had to develop not only a language to discuss with the people who appeared in it, but um, all the technicians and the people that were working behind the scenes and, and just how to even be able to present it. So that's just some technical stuff for some people who might find that interesting. Um, and so now I'm just going to exit and stop share. So um, that's my little intro to the project and um, I look forward to, we're going to have a bit of a conversation and some other, yeah, um, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I, I wonder if I could bother you to see if you can put your hands on an image of the original wallpaper or possibly the three graces in the original wallpaper with your reenactment of it, because I think people who haven't seen the wallpaper would find that really fascinating. Um, so hopefully that won't distract you too much while we're... Okay, I'll look for that in the background and I'll bring it up. <laughs> while you're talking and everything. It's, it's, so um, at this point, I'd like to turn um, to Julia Lum, who has a couple of questions for Lisa. Hi, thank you very much, Joanne, uh, and thank you, Lisa. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge that I'm zooming in today from Claremont, California, which is on the unceded ancestral territory of the Tongva peoples. So Lisa, um, the, the Maori architectural historian Deidre Brown has written about this work in relation to the concept of Turanga Waiwai, which 
roughly translates to a place from which to stand. And here you've created this brilliant virtual Turanga YY for your collaborators to intercede in a visual history that has been told up until recent decades from the perspective of European vision. So I'm wondering where your, your, your work imagines the intended viewer um, as you know, global viewers approach this work, uh, what vantage point does the viewer occupy? And, and, and you mentioned that conversation that takes place. So I'm just curious if you could elaborate on that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually loved when uh, Deirdre talked about it as this virtual Tūlanga Waiwai. Um, our Tūlanga Waiwai is for me, um, when I did my introduction, is the far north, that's in my tribal homelands. But of course this is, um, not only is it a digital work, but it's this kind of pan-tribal idea. And in the wallpaper, it's this sort of, um, it's supposed to be maybe Tahiti is the place where where um, all these um, scenes are taking place. But of course, it's it's just this made up idea. So I think what's great about it is it sort of because it doesn't exist, it's non-existent. So it doesn't belong to anybody and therefore it can belong to everybody. And so I think um, there's this sort of flattening out. It becomes um, a place to hold anyone and it's a place where anyone can speak from. In our tribal spaces and our, um, our whare nui, which would be very similar to um, longhouses, uh, just um, for people's uh, imagining of the kind of places where, where we hold community meetings. What I love about those is when you're inside the house, it's a safe place and it's a place where everyone has the right to speak. So we stand, when we're having meetings, people can stand and at that time they take the floor. And anyone with a young, old, female, whatever, um, it gives you a place to speak from. And I think that's a wonderful um, aspect of our, our Maori culture and Pacific cultures. So for me, when I was thinking about, we're all, we're looking from the land and we're looking out towards the sea. And so what that means is I'm kind of um, nativizing the viewer. In a sense, I'm giving them a perspective of maybe even peeking through from behind. So in some of the scenes you're looking at, for instance, there's a haka being performed to the ocean. And it was really important, although it's very privileged and it's something that uh, Mari are really well known for is the haka, seeing it from the front. But seeing it from behind is really, it's completely reversing that idea. And I wanted people to feel the power from a different position, that you're being um, protected from the front. So um, that was my idea, is to really try and bring the audience into seeing from a different view, rather than looking as the person who's kind of taking the lens, you're on the land and, someone's, and that feeling of being bought, you know, seeing the arrival and all the kind of ceremonies that happen on the shore. A, a few years ago in New Zealand, there was a um, um, seabed and foreshore debate, of which is still being debated. So, uh, you know, the, the land, but you know, that moment, it's a real interstitial space and it's a, a, a space of great conflict and it's the place of arrival and departure. So it's a really interesting and very loaded space. Yeah, I'm really interested in this also because when you look at the body of artworks from French and English voyages, you tend to have a good number of panoramic views that are coastal profiles. So it's from the mobile shipboard artist who's recording the elevation as they're moving. And here you've done something really radically different. I think you've inverted that by placing the viewer on the land and having the landscape sort of revolve around in this, this kind of imaginary landscape as well. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the sort of embodied experience of this work. I mean, I've, I've, I have seen this work in a few different occasions and you really, um, you really also need to experience it um, in addition to seeing uh, the, the visual images from it, from it in the stills. And the, the naturalist Joseph Banks, who appears in a lot of these vignettes that you've created, justified the necessity of artists like Sidney Parkinson because artists could um, provide a visual information that describes, in his words, far better than words can. So there's this primacy of the visual in the 18th century. But I think your work is one of those that embodies a kind of extrasensory or other, other senses. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how your work engages those senses. Sure. Um, 
Well, I have to say, I do. I did fall in love with Sydney Parkinson through <laughs> through the making of this work, um, and that's. Fall in love uh, sounds very strong. I suppose I really um, had a kindred spirit with him in terms of him being an artist. He was very young when he attended this voyage um, and on the way over, there were two others and one passed away um, on the way to Tahiti. So Sydney Parkinson really took over a lot of the, the heavy lifting in terms of the illustration. He was there as a botany um, illustrator initially, but then eventually uh, came to record many beautiful um, portraits, as, does, as did Weber. And these are really important to us because these are the documents of our ancestors. So I also thought about how brave um, the artists would have been. People like Banks and Cook would have landed and they would have had Marines with them. So they're like the, the constabulary. They would have had guns as they were sort of charging through, um, charging through the lands. The artists were much more quieter and they, they were sort of um, really observing and seeing things at a different pace. And so, you know, we, we often refer to these, these early images as much as we, um, as much as we need to read, read through them, um, but they are very important documents. One of the things when I was looking at the wallpaper, the original wallpaper, I counted how many people are in it. There's about 150 different characters. And what that suggested to me is um, a cacophony of sound that you could never have done through a wallpaper. So by recording um, these various scenes and kind of foregrounding them as they move through it past the viewer, you start to get the sense of things coming in or hearing a sound from far away. Um, we did quite a clever thing where the, the um, speakers, the sound actually passes you by because the work can be anywhere from 17 metres to 24 metres wide. So sound kind of comes and goes. You have this real perspective. So there is a sense of being in a space. Um, there are natural sounds of birds and the sea, which um, are really important sounds to Pacific people. Um, and that kind of uh, encases you as well. Um, but also, um, I really wanted to compare um, there's a whole lot of Pacific waiata and dance practices and sounds, tattooing sounds. And that kind of embeds you in this feeling. I don't know, the, the, the combination of all those things, even though you're indoors watching something, you do have this sense of being outdoors. It's funny, um, you kind of get, you, you get lulled into this work. When people first see it and they don't know what it is, it kind of, you know, stops them in their tracks and they have to sit down and try and work it out. For me, that working out is really important. For me, it's like that idea of when people, when um, not just the Westerners and the Pacific people saw each other for the, for the very first time and they're looking at each other and trying to understand what these ceremonies are. I think that's a feeling that the um, viewer gets when they see this work. Sometimes I go, what's that about? Or, you know, they'll, they'll ask me afterwards. I go, yeah, it's really interesting. What is that thing? You can own, you have to go on your wits. And I think there's this, um, this sort of, um, not playing down, I don't know, this broadcast, there was this idea of the lowest common denominator. Or I'm not, I don't want to spell everything out. I think making people work for that knowledge is a really, it's a really, great thing and you'll see children will watch it and they'll get up and dance and sometimes they roll across <laughs> they'll do roly polies and follow little scenes along if they particularly like them um, and people will move around so I think that's it's quite a different um, cinematic experience than just staying in one place so that's that's the difference I suppose of video installation in a gallery setting there is that opportunity to move or follow with it. So there's a spaciousness that's kind of created for the viewer and uh, even though it's a very flat screen work. I don't know what else to say. There's many things to say, but I hope that kind of covers your, your thoughts. Yeah, and depending on when the viewer enters when, during a loop, it also will change the meaning depending on what part of the narrative you enter in. So yes, you. yes. 
I, I think we should move to Marissa now, but before Marissa starts asking questions, I just want to um, say that if there are people in the audience that want to send us questions, they should use the Q&A um, function at the bottom of the page, and then we'll try to get to some of those too. So Marissa, why don't you go ahead? Great. And um... Uh, I'm going to ask and I'm going to hope that my dog is going to be good because I can hear her growling very softly in the background, such as uh, such as what happens on uh, doing these um, during COVID from home. But um, Lisa, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. And as Julia said in her question um, about sort of the power of the embodied experience with this particular work of art. Um, now, I think we are really all very excited, those of us who are in Providence um, and we'll get to really experience this next fall. So um, thank you for the presentation, but I'm also really looking forward to that experience um, a year from now. Um, my question is, um, it seems like your, worth is, your work is both um, a response and critique of historic representations of Maori culture and identity as primitive and static, but it also seems like your work engages with questions of institutional collecting who commissioned and collected the work of the past and how it was displayed. Um, In Pursuit of Venus, I think was first shown um, at Alberton House, one of the colonial grand houses of Auckland and in Amsterdam. It, I think it was, if you can correct me if this is um, right or wrong, it was also shown in a colonial house. Um, and then at the Toronto Film and Media Festival and at the Venice Biennale, it was not shown in a colonial context. Um, so as Joanne said at the beginning, we at the Public Humanities Center are really thinking about the life of these colonial representations today, um, the challenges they pose for us, and what our responsibilities are um, in what we do with them. So in some ways, uh, we have become, um, uh, or our wallpaper that is very similar has become part of our institutional collection, which is why I'm particularly interested in this question. So what I'm wondering is how you think about the question of how and where you most like this work to be seen, or, or maybe not just this work, but sort of all your work, um, and share with us, you know, sort of what uh, for you feels um, like uh, the right context for it, um, and how these changes of location um, sometimes change its meaning or reception. Sure. Um, okay. So just trying to pick apart a few of the things you said. Um, for me, um, well, I see myself very much as a contemporary artist and I don't want to, I don't w want the work just to be historicized, but having said that, I know it's looking at historical, um, at histories and, and it's critiquing them. So you can't help but be part of that, um, that, that, that ebb and flow. Um, so for me, unless it's this year or the last two years, we've had a lot of anniversaries and commemorations of Captain Cook. And I chose not to have, have this work seen in, particularly in that context. Um, but I have no issue about whether they're in a museum or a gallery. I mean, for me, the thing that's more important is um, I do make work to be seen. Um, it's silly to, you know, spend 10 years working on something and holding it back unless there's a, a really strong reason not to. And I do think that you get different audiences um, in museums and galleries, certainly here in, here in New Zealand. Some people, some Indigenous people don't feel comfortable about going into contemporary gallery spaces. It's very hard to try and um, invite them in and, and, and then take ownership of those types of spaces, unless there are works that they feel speak to them. So when we showed the work here in Auckland, it had a really, you know, it had a very high risk, large numbers, and we did get lots of people coming in. And what was more interesting to me is, um, I think we had um, over a three month period, we had a visitation of about 50,000 people. Um, but a lot of them were return visits. So it was people coming in and then bringing other people back, which, which was very heartwarming to me because it meant there was a sort of um, 
there was something that happened within the community or this ha piqued their interest that wanted them to bring their grandmothers back or their cousins or, or what have you. And also people saw their cousins in the work and so the reception's quite different, you know. Um, they go, oh, there's auntie blah blah or there's, there's my cousin, you know, there was, a, there was a conversation and a hum that sort of happens in the screening space that you don't normally get in a, in a cinema as well. Um, I'm very happy, I feel really honoured, in fact, that the work is currently shown at the Art Gallery of Ontario and it's shown within the Indigenous Gallery there. So there's a lot of contemporary um, and Native artists, Indigenous artists in there and for me I feel very proud of that because it, it feel, I feel like I'm in a collegial situation um, that the conversations are transported outwards and and really speak to a lot of the imagery and the, uh, the works that are within the show so I think there's different kind of conversations that start to happen so it stops it from just being historical viewed historically but people see it in a, in a kind of an ongoing you know we're in a continuum of these issues they, they continue today um, when the work, it's also been included in a beautiful show called Oceania, which was um, borrowed a lot of um, customary works from museums all around the world, but um, also included, I think, eight contemporary artists speaking to different aspects. And the value, I think, of In Pursuit of Venus infected in that context was a reminder that um, these, we call them taonga, not artifacts. Taonga are like precious ancestral objects. But it was a reminder that the maker, makers of these, um, these beautiful taonga are people. So that was probably where you saw the most, uh, um, where people would mostly recognize people. Because of course, all these ancestral figures, carvings, um, representations often they but they slip into this feeling of being sort of like an object whereas they are a representation of an ancestor and that kind of privileging that we have like with a kind of photographic or the camera lens mediums really make you think about the human figure so um it's something that i I've worked with a bit throughout other works. Um, when you go into um, our, um, our meeting house, our whare nui, or what would be like a long house, sometimes people would say you can't take a photograph, always on the back wall of the ancestors who have passed. And you have issues about taking photographs of the photographs, but the carvings are okay. Um, whereas the carvings are representations of people. So there is this kind of shift that starts to happen. And it's, for me, it's um, kind of making, there's an interesting connection that kind of gets lost some, sometimes in that kind of visual reading. So, Marissa, did you want to ask another, or shall we move on? I do, but I don't want to dominate, and uh, I, and I know Anon wants to ask. Um, and again, I'm just I also feel very um, blessed, just because I'm sure there are people on this call besides Julia who will not be in Providence next year. So, I'm looking forward to that. No, so I, I do have questions, but um, I would love to hear what Anwan has to say, and if the other people have them as well. Okay, so Anwan, you are up. Uh, just want to say thank you to everybody who allowed me to be part of this conversation. Uh, as Marissa just pointed out, I'm sure there's a lot of Q&A that I think we're all hoping to get to as well. So uh, I just, I, I want to say thank you, uh, Lisa, for this work that has brought us all here to discuss this tonight. Um, really stimulating to me as an artist, you know, as a, a indigenous artist uh, fighting to represent people who may not always want to put themselves out there in the limelight and whatnot. Um, you know, I just found this, the way that you captivated multimedia uh, to reach so many audiences, so many ways, 
I've been very fortunate to work at Boston Children's Museum, which really wanted to make their collections accessible to the people, like so that they could physically maybe even hold parts of history and whatnot. So um, and in a way, I see that you have effectively done that in this piece of yours. But um, I've been very fortunate to witness uh, not firsthand uh, Maori culture, but uh, the, through my work with the King Kamehameha schools over in Hawaii, uh, seeing their immersion programs that they reiterated over and over again were entirely based off the Maori example. Um, in our tribal community, we're also trying to create a charter school for our community. So I really just want to drive my, my uh, comments and questions, I guess, to you to cater to that native community of uh, people who I hope are watching this now and hopefully will chime in themselves. But, uh, you know, as, as native artists, uh, it's, it's, I'm really, really pleased to see how you were able to shy away from the European views of us. I mean, uh, so many artists that depict us with their own views in mind. It's what they want to see, let alone how they interpret seeing it. Um, I often reflect on artwork from that era and it doesn't reflect on me personally. So um, could you speak more to the creative process? Again, knowing Maori culture is so community driven, um, just to, to have tattoos, I'm sure to have a display like this speak on behalf of the people. So if you could just talk more maybe about the networking that's necessary to include uh, as you, were, you attributed it to comparing it to a longhouse, how everyone has a voice. Um, so if you could just speak more to that to inspire other natives who might want to take on a similar mission. Sure. Oh, it's nice to um, speak with you, Anne Um Well, it was, you know, from my early years of becoming an artist, um, back in the 1990s, there was a real push um, to bring um, our, our, uh, our thoughts, our whakaaro our, and our imagery and trying to advocating with the government to create percentage on television. So that was really one of the, a really early push was um, 10 minutes of Maori news, um, Maori programming and just recording elders before they passed. So that was the kind of backdrop of politics that was happening when I was at art school. And so I got very much um, caught up in that idea and really starting to pick apart um, the images that circulated and and try to really read through them, what, what rang true from the, the portraits of people, um, chiefs, unknown people, all sorts of images, and then trying to strip off that veneer of the angle, the perspective that it was taken from. So I attended a lot of um, meetings and gatherings at that time. Um, now, 30 years later, it's a very strong network. There's um, film and broadcast um, groups, Na'ahau Whakari, um, there's radio networks here. So it's about trying to naturalise um, and, and um, bring our language into the forefront. It's quite different in New Zealand, of course, because we have one language. There are, there are tribal nuances, but actually there's one language. So it gives us a sort of strength that perhaps other, other groups may not have. Um, the meet, meeting tribal gatherings, um, I suppose in the making of the work, um, over many years of being an artist for 20 years and it's not just the Maori um, representing Maori culture but also all the Pacific other Pacific cultures which is a very dangerous place to step actually and I know that there are people who there are a few instances where people are unhappy with the work that I have done um, in the sense that they're saying it's not um, it's not uh, exactly true, but I know it's not exactly true because the whole thing is a construct in a sense. Even starting from the idea of shooting in the green screen space. When you're shooting green screen, it means that you can't have green clothing. And one of the, one of the you know, and from a costume perspective, one of the beautiful um, design work that you see is these incredible dresses that are made from um, layering, um, greenery, uh, leaves, and so 
we, we already created or discounted um, something that's um, very beautiful and alive, like these dresses that might just be used in ceremony for one day. So, you know, this idea of authenticity is really hard to, it's, it's, a, hard, um, it's a hard level to aspire to. Uh, and you can, well, I aspire to it, but it's a hard level to attain, I should say. And so the only thing I could do is do it with as much integrity as I could and speaking and asking and talking with many people. Um, in fact, you know, working with language, uh, the, the actors who are representing uh, the scene of Cook's um, there's a scene with Captain Cook when he's going through the ceremony about Lono. It's being undertaken in the Samoan language and I, I, I really debated with myself whether to take the voice away and just have it um, more as a, um, a silent vignette or not. And then I thought about we've had so many years of our voices being taken away. Um, I was thinking about the actors are, um, they, they are the children of our ancestors who have fought to retain these language practices and these other practices. So it's in that kind of space that it's sort of not authentic, but there's a reason to try and, um, you know, try and tra traverse these spaces and try and not take our voice away again and again. And so I suppose that's, to me, I, I was always the most problematic thing um, is also uh, the actors around Captain Cook at his death are not um, Hawaiian people because I, I just couldn't afford to fly people in. I had to try and um, create the work uh, in, the, in the most, in the best way that I could. And and um, I'm hopeful that it is more inspiring for other people to then um, pick up that mantle and produce their own works too. Maybe it's ins inspirational in that sense of, I know that the previous illustrators didn't do, you know, there's issues that I have with them. And if there's issues with me, I hope it inspires other people to, to do the same. Well, we don't have any questions, but we do have a comment, um, which I will read. And this comes from Anya Montel, who is a PhD student. And she says, I just wanted to thank Lisa Rihanna for her amazing and deeply emotional work in pursuit of Venus infected. I saw the work at the Young Museum in San Francisco with my mother. She couldn't stop watching and afterward told me, quote, that's one artwork that one artwork was worth my annual membership to the museum. It was so powerful. <laughs> my mother is not a regular museum goer and she couldn't stop talking about it. So pretty nice compliment. Oh, no, that's cool. That's very cool. <laughs> would anyone else like to ask something before we wrap up? I would like to ask Anna one, um, because um, I I'm sure he's probably um, struggling with these kind of issues, or we all are, of how to inspire and how to get our own voices across, whether he had any strategies or um, techniques that he's utilised in his work um, across these kind of issues as well. Um, unfortunately, nothing on your scale. I'm not nearly as computer savvy or... I guess I would need the network of friends. Uh, I, I have a feeling Brown University might lend me that help though. Um, so, um, but no, it's really just the ideas and the motivation. Like I, I was really inspired seeing how it was just you with the, your, your iPhone kind of shows the age of, of when you first started this project. Um, same with our linguist uh, when she was just having these visions or whatever inspired her those pivotal moments that basically as artists we just cannot turn down and walk away from you know uh voices that again you may have silenced in the past in your head that you just can't and it just really pushes you to get uh it's, it's i really feel that it's the ancestors you know motivating us to do some of these things but again i just can't speak enough to the way that you took this piece that you know i look at again a lot of the colonial artwork and it does not reflect me in any way. I'm looking at testosterone driven artistry. I'm seeing uh, straight European view sets, you know, like viewpoints, you know. Um, so it's like really to, to, to step back and, and literally look at it from our lens. It's something that even today, I think for folks who struggle with 
uh, the impacts of colonization that we have to peel back those layers just to get to that level of understanding, let alone intrigue. So um, I really personally just want to, again, say that you personally have motivated me. And I really do hope that there are other Native artists who are looking at how you took a piece from the past, something that could have catastrophically been left to represent us for future generations. And you just literally transformed it into a living, breathing example of a community driven message that according to what I was reading, you can even add to hopefully over generations to come. So I, I think that's a hat trick in itself and hats off to you. Uh, very inspirational. Kilda, thank you. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to end our conversation today. I, I want to thank everyone um, for, oh, wait, I have a question. I have a question from Professor Tim Berenger, who is at Yale. Um, Tim asks, I'd like to ask Lisa about panoramas and the panoramic. How does she feel about this history? This is a colonial medium, which she has so brilliantly turned around upon its own ideal ideology. Um, uh, I think the panoramas are incredibly beautiful. Uh, when I was first um, studying as a student, an art student, um, originally there was um, projectors were on long lengths of film. So in a way this work um, technically sort of speaks to that idea of, um, of, of technologies, but also um, in our carving practices, we have um, a, a, a kuru, a, um, I don't know what the word is in, in English, I don't know how to translate it, but it's the idea of <clears throat> things folding in on themselves, um, spirals, um, and spirals um, from the front view look like this, but if you look through them, they're like through time. So the interesting thing about them is that the lines intersect. So, you know, we, we see life as a continuum. So past, present and future is always implicit at any one time. So for me to be able to take this work and use it um, as, a, as a way of the people who are in it are talking back through time to the people who have been recorded and the original illustrations that ended up in the wallpaper. So there's this opportunity to kind of stretch it out. Even thinking about um, Captain Cook and his recording of the um, transit of Venus, which is where the name, one of the, the a reference to in the title, you know, if you start looking at the telescopes and people looking at the stars, I mean, it is that awe and wonder that humans, we need to remember to look at the stars. And I think the problem with so much light spillage in our lives these days is you forget that awe and wonder and why people looked up and wanted to know about them better. It very much got co-opted um, for the um, creating longitude. Um, but I think, I know that someone wanted to ask about this idea of in pursuit of Venus infected. The infected um, uh, relates to this idea of pathogens, but to me it also relates to the idea of knowledge. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. And so I like to think that I'm infecting the rest of the world with a way of looking at our cyclical way of looking at the world. So that's a, a slightly roundabout way of giving one an answer to um, Tim. So thank you. Thank you for that question. Well, and thank you for your wrap up on the, the title. Um, was, was there a certain point, I know there was, but I don't know where it is, that you added that to your title and, and, and what was going on that encouraged you to do that? The first version of In Pursuit of Venus was shown at the um, Museum Van Loan, and that was my test um, run for the work and in that work it was really just a, a reference to the wallpaper so there's just Pacific people in it and then once I'd worked out the how I was going to technically create the work and I brought the Western people in and I wanted to make them implicit in these histories um, that's when the infected came along. Um, I would also like to say that a lot of my artworks um, reference love so the idea of Venus is um, has a reference to love and um, 
post 9 11 uh, there's a group of a small group of artists we, we created this network called the love will make love foundation um, and aloha is the, our word and like aloha so i try and often try and inject that sense of love into the works as well so kind of a, a critique a critique with a sense of hope sits underneath a lot of the, the projects that I make. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank um, everyone, Marissa, Anawan, Julia, and Lisa, and thank the people at home for joining in. It's, I, it's been wonderful, and I, I look forward to meeting you again next year in yes, Providence. Thanks. So, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Right. If the world right. out. <laughs> so thank you very much. I think we'll we'll end there. Good night, all. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.